Uh, so I'm here to talk about ecosystem roles of insects. Uh, when we put together this, this, this uh, program for today, we thought we'd walk you through in a progressive uh, way to, to, you know, what it is, what's the history? What's the bad? What's the reality? Um, so then we were going to some agronomic practices, but that talk was yesterday, which is really great. And so I'm going to talk about, okay, what are the other critters that are out there? What are they doing? Um, we use this very judgmental term, pest. Um, that's a label we put on these things, whether it's a weed or, or an insect or what have you. So that's, I'd like to get away from that kind of terminology and just hope you uh, embrace the idea of what these things are doing in the environment and what that role is. And so Mayor Iveson, on Friday night's forum, talked about the infrastructure needs that urban development requires. So if we're going to have this urban sprawl instead of being denser communities and, and more focused and clustered around our workplaces, you know, reduced commuting, etc., that you need to, you know, because that will save on infrastructure. But we have to think about infrastructure functions in our gardens, in our landscapes, in our fields. And so that's what I hope to address today is that kind of infrastructure. And then Luke's going to give you a really interesting view about, okay, how do I build that infrastructure so that I can recruit and conserve, conserve the beneficials that we have, recruit the ones that we need. Uh, and Dakota's going to say, well, here it is in living color. So this is fantastic, really cool stuff that we're going to be going through with you today. So I just have a very few pictures, but I'm going to address this slide, so some points about what they are, and then the next slide. So I look at the functional roles of the insects or arthropods, hard and crunchy things, uh, versus soft and squishy. I won't get into the soft and squishy, uh, maybe worms. Uh, but, uh, we always know about pollinators. Everyone talks about pollinators, and there is a crisis with, with honeybees, with uh, beyond honeybees, because they're an invasive alien species in North America. They're brought over from Europe. They're not native to North America. We've exploited them to great effect for honey production and pollination services, but to the point that it's almost an industrial robot uh, where we truck them around. Because it, uh, almost two thirds of all the hives in the United States are trucked to California for, to pollinate almonds every spring. And you wonder why there are problems with, uh, when there's, a, there's a whole host of things that will attack bees. But uh, it's like send all your kids to the same daycare, and you know, one of the children has the measles or the flu, and all the kids go back home and they're all ill. So you bring all, you know, two thirds of the hives in North America, virtually, into one locality, and they all intermingle. So it's the lowest common denominator. If there's a beekeeper who's not had the highest standards or doesn't have a healthy colony, those problems can spread amongst the other bees as well. So there are issues with our pollinators. And that's just the, the industrial robot one, uh, Apis mellifera. But we have so many native species. And this is something I think we, we don't understand or are care to, to focus on is the role and function and real benefit that our native pollinators will provide. And I'll show you, it's not just bees. So bumblebees, leafcutter bees, digger bees, uh, sweat bees, there's uh, plaster bees. There's a, a whole host of species. There's 27 species of bumblebee alone known from Alberta. Uh, there's, I think, um, about 400 species of, of other native bee in Alberta. Uh, there's 22,000 species of bees worldwide. So, I mean, there's a real rich diversity of these pollinators that we know and love. And what's really nice about native species, they're adapted to our climate. So a lot of our native bush fruit, I've worked in, in a lot of our native fruits for a number of years, and if you don't get pollination, you're not going to get that yield. You're not going to get that productivity for all the animals to feed on. And they're typically very early flowering because uh, they're hardy, and some of the flowers can take a, a good frost, not a killing frost, minus 7, but certainly a, a minus 4 or minus 2. And the bumblebees can take that. They just shrug it off. They uh, thermoregulate. They sit there and they just buzz their wings, generating heat through their muscles, raise their body temperature, and then they can go out. You know, honeybees, forget it. If it isn't sunny, low wind, uh, and warm, I'm not going to work today. But when they do go to work, I give them credit. They're busy as a bee, right? Uh, but certainly the native bees will fly in higher wind conditions, uh, even a light drizzle in some cases, in some species, uh, definitely at cooler temperatures and much earlier in the season. So that's something to take uh, into consideration. If you're growing on a large scale, these pollinators, Honeybees will fly up to five, even as much as 10 kilometers in foraging for pollen. So they're really good at large commercial scale canola fields and you know, large plantations, that sort of thing. Bumblebees, they're kind of home bodies, maybe 500 meters. 
They don't like penetrating deep into monoculture fields. So this is why you need a lot of habitat. And so those needs for those bees, they require that nesting uh, site. They require uh, a diversity of foodstuffs. I mean, I like peanut butter, but I can't eat that every day for every meal, right? So are you gonna feast on canola for their entire lives? No, not at all. And recently some research has come out at the University of Calgary out of Ralph Carter's lab, and Paul Gelpert as well, a professor there as well, looking at uh, when bumblebees are in proximity or uh, into to uh, canola fields, their their hive, their nesting uh, populations actually decline because there's this flush of canola resources, and so the queens are just cranking out the kids like crazy, thinking, "Oh wow, the world's great." But then as soon as the canola stops flowering, it's finished. Boom, there's virtually no resources, or very few resources, and, the, and that bumblebee colony collapses. Not the same kind of colony collapse disorder that honeybees get, but they've run out of food. And so you actually get fewer overwintering queens in proximity to canola fields. So these large monocultures do have a potential for a negative impact on our native species. Um, honeybees also are a bit bullies, you know, because there's so many of them. Their hives tend to be 1,000 to 50,000 individuals. Bumblebees, it's Eh, 50 to 100 maybe uh, to an individual nest. So honeybees, when they go foraging, they can actually sort of bogart the resources. They'll, they'll bully the, the bumblebees and take over a lot of the resources. So I just urge you uh, some caution with backyard beekeeping, urban beekeeping, that you ensure that there are ample, ample nectaring sources and pollen sources so that uh, native bees in the area are not put out. So, because there have been well-documented negative interactions between honeybees and our native bees. So, um, be good to the native bees, please. At any rate, um, but there's not just bees. I'll show you some pictures of some other things that are pollinating. So, um, and there's lots of stuff there. These are the unsung heroes. Let me tell you, if we're talking about uh, recycling, not downcycling, but true recycling of nutrients in a system, especially a permaculture system, you need the decomposers. Right, the plant dies, what's going to turn it back into soil? What's going to liberate those nutrients? It isn't all microorganisms. Yes, we have to, we need a healthy soil microbiome, no question about it. But we need things to break it up. Because the fungus goes, that's a whole leaf. I can't tackle a whole leaf. I can colonize a little bit of the surface. So you need things to chew it up and break it up, and turn it into frass, right? Um, so you need things to be liberated. That's that whole cycle. And the decomposers are really, really important. I mean, they're not the nicest. I mean, they're wallowing in muck. But, so people tend not to pay much attention to them. But they're super important. Uh, predators and parasitoids. I spent pretty much my whole career working with these and pathogens to manage insects without using pesticides to reduce pesticide use as much as possible by exploiting our natural resources, our natural ecosystem services. Herbivores, not a bad thing. Honestly, yes, these insects are feeding on your plants, but you know, like they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Bit of a misquote from Nietzsche, but anyway, it'll work. Is that you have some small level of stress or challenge stimulates an awful lot of what we call secondary plant compound production. So I call it flavor, uh, medicinal value, and functional value, because it's stimulating a lot of the compounds, whether they be vitamins or antioxidants, that are typically associated with the healthfulness of a food that we consume. So it, and similarly, a little bit of drought stress, more sugar. I need to hold on to the water that I have, I'll produce sugar to bind that water that I have. A study out of Texas A&M showed that if you reduced the irrigation levels by fully 25%, you had better watermelon. I don't know why they're growing watermelon in Texas, but anyway, uh, so, but at any rate, so you can see that there's a lot of things going on. Okay, and then I also want to highlight this nutrient cycling, right, that decomposition of organic matter. Uh, and I'll stress that again and again and again. Uh, nutrient availability through biomass. Thank you. I worked on mosquitoes all my graduate work. Uh, so in the filtering of by larval mosquitoes, you have this fine particulate organic matter. So a leaf falls into a pond or a slough, and it breaks down slowly, and it's just shredders that tear it apart, and then it's coarse our particular organic matter, and you get caddis flies and other things that are taking those bits apart. But then there's these little tiny particles, even protein molecules in suspension called colloidal proteins. And who takes that out of the water? Who takes all that murkiness out of the water? Mosquitoes in still waters, black flies, and other filtering insects in running waters. So you take what is an inaccessible biological resource, 
concentrated into a, a larger scale organism, in this case mosquito larvae, and then they get fed on. So you're basically helping that cycling of those nutrients. And so insects will do that in soil um, and help to take what is unavailable and make it available again. So everything has a role. Population management. Yes, predators, parasitoids, oh no, no, right? They're chewing on things and they're keeping populations low. No question about it. And that's a, a role that we exploit to great effect in biological control or conserving our natural enemies that are out there and allowing them to manage it, right? They're on duty 24 7, right? Take, it, take that burden off your shoulders. Let nature look after itself. But it also strengthens populations. And you're wondering, really, Ken? Uh, a 10 year outbreak of forest tent caterpillar just nuked my aspen? How is that good for the aspen? Think about it. You have three years, successive years of defoliation. What doesn't survive that? Should never have been alive. Yeah. A little bit of chlorine in the old gene pool, basically. Um, most predators do not go after the biggest, the strongest. They go after the weakest, the sick, weird Uncle Ed, that kind of thing, right? So <laughs> they, they take out, not that it has to be weird, but, anyway, <laughs> but they take out what is not contributing meaningfully to that population's gene pool. So they're actually doing a population a favor. So, so much of the world is interpreted as this competition. It's really not a competition. If you really want to understand biology and the world around us, it's mutualism. Everything is contributing meaningfully to the entire ecosystem, and that would be global, and so our biosphere, but on a local scale, it may seem like it's tooth and claw, but no, it is a mutualism. They are serving each other's needs. And that's what we have to try and get in sync with, be harmonious with, is let's recognize what these roles are, how they contribute meaningfully to a healthy, resilient, and that's another key t term because of the um, changes occurring now in climate change. We had a nice equilibrium going, right? Nice smooth water. But now, you bump the system out of equilibrium, and you get these high amplitude oscillations, colder colds, hotter hots, more intense storms, more frequent events, these sorts of things. There's no normal. You know, that statistical calculation called an average or mean is meaningless because it never actually occurs. Like our normal temperature is supposed to be minus three today. No, it was minus nine, it was what, minus 11 today, it was plus three a couple of days ago. There is no normal anymore. We're getting these oscillations. And so how do we buffer that? What's the buffering capacity? And that's what a nice equilibrium is, is you have a buffering capacity. If you have a really robust ecosystem, you have that buffering capacity so that you can weather some of the worser droughts or the, the hotter hots and colder colds. Lastly, there's an awful lot to be said for, say, landscape remediation, landscape health through toxin sequestration. So you can have plants, and animals for that matter, uh, remove material that's in a distributed, chronic, low-dose, toxic situation, and then sequester that into a concentrated area, and then you take those plants away, and then you properly dispose of them. Um, so it's easily identified. So you can clean up and remediate some brownfield sites, some old industrial sites, and who knows what was left. Uh, a grower south of Calgary put in 15 acres of black currants and didn't understand why for three years they stayed really, really stunted. So they did a soil test, and the amount of herbicide that had been used on that land because they'd only recently purchased it, there was a 20 year sort of residual activity of that herbicide that had been used on that land. So, their bushes, instead of being productive in three years, weren't productive for seven years. And that's like, so you need to try and clean up your lands as much as possible. All right, onto the pictures. Yay! Well, that's a picture of sorts. Just, uh, it's not me, I love insects, let me tell you. Or just have a grudging respect for the ones that, that are challenging. But um, it, most recent uh, data on how many species there are in the world that we know, about 1.2 million. Estimates of up to 30 million actually occurring. Not including microbes, this is just eukaryotes. So plants, animals, moving algae, that sort of stuff. Um, so if you look at it, hard and crunchy things are almost 80% of everything that, that we know of. Honestly, uh, vertebrates are, they don't even register as a percent. So we're not all we think we are, you know? We're just kidding, minor. You know, plants, everything else is 21%. But even among the vertebrates, things with hair and nipples are only 9%, honestly. <laughs> So, I mean, I was going to do the calculation, but it's a long string of zeros. We're point zero, 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 zero. So, we're a very small component of the ecosystem. 
we do need to pay attention, we do need to preserve, we do need to conserve, and we do need to relish in the role that these majority are doing for us. If we ignore them, if we destroy them with pesticides, it's little wonder we suffer. Right? So who are they? Um, is that a <laughs> Looks like it though. It's actually a hoverfly. Very good. Yeah. So it's a surfity, and uh, so they're they're, they're V mimics, and and um, uh, you've got a, a box of stuff out there. No, sorry, you've got a box of stuff, Luke, right? <laughs> and and so what Luke has is if you go out there and you look, you'll see the the wanda bees. I love that. That's great. <laughs> so they're V mimics. You know, I'm a fly. I can't sting you. Uh, there's not much I can do. So uh, lots of things. Even though you think it's a bee, it may not be a bee. It's actually a fly. And the kids, the larvae, feed on aphids and other soft-bodied insects. So you get pollination and population management. So a double whammy from those are really great. Uh, look at this. This is a, a subfamily of beetles, uh, and oh, he just got his head right into his work. I mean, that's the yeah, the longhorn beetles. I know they bore into trees and stems and stuff like that, but that's their job. They're arborists. Bring the tree down because that's a goner. Uh, but these things are really good pollinators. So if you look in wild roses, there's a whole community of animals that are going into those flowers. And, and so it's not a bad thing to see beetles in a bloom. It's not a bad thing to see bees in a bloom, obviously, right? Moths. Now that one I put up specifically, uh, you know, in, intentionally. It's in the genus Homeris. It's a day flying moth. It's called a clear wing moth. Some people call them hummingbird moths. But uh, the real hummingbird moth is in the United States. We, these are just clearing moths that are hot moths, but you see how it's holding its body away from the bloom? Butterflies and moths have a really long proboscis, and it's, they siphon nectar out of the flowers. So uh, I'm too pretty, I don't want your stuff on me. So a lot of butterflies and moths are not the best pollinators. I know we like to encourage butterfly gardens, absolutely, they're beautiful. There's nothing like seeing a flutterby, right? You know, I just think they should have been called flutterbys, not butterflies. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they're, they're just gorgeous animals, but they're not the most efficient or effective pollinators. Yes, they visit for nectar, and it's a bit of a parasite uh, relationship with the flowers. Some of them are good pollinators, because the moths, especially at nighttime when they go to any open blooms at nighttime, they're good pollinators. But the daytime ones, not so much. So. But just be aware, there are all kinds of pollinators out there. The decomposers, Clemola, uh, not really an insect, I don't have six legs, but it's, uh, sort of an, uh, it's branched off from insects. Uh, Gung beetles, fantastic animals, otherwise we'd be hip deep and hard crusty bits. Uh, earthworms, great. Uh, I have to put a plug in. There's a student at the University of Alberta who's studying earthworms in the province, trying to uh, do a more recent, there was a study some years ago, 15 years ago, eight species of earthworm back in Alberta. We were all scrubbed away after the last ice age, right? So we were worm free for the last 10,000 years. Um, they've only migrated northward from, what was it, latitude 47, about maybe 200 miles. Every earthworm in Alberta was introduced by humans, for the most part. And, uh, so anglers bringing bait in and dropping it off uh, near lakes and stuff, horticulturists bringing it in with uh, soil material, that sort of thing. So, but they were trying to find out, okay, what earthworms are here, how many are native species, like formerly from, from before the glacial periods, and how many are introduced, like the big honkin dewworm, that's that scientific term, big honkin, uh, <laughs> is uh, the night crawler, that's an invasive species from, from Europe. So, but we, we do need as much as we can, oh, it's silly. We're actually importing uh, European dung beetles into southern Alberta because the insecticides that were used on cattle for block flies, warble flies, right? Uh, basically, would accumulate in their dung and it would kill off all the dung beetles, so you'd have hard pan on the rangelands. And so they've had to, now that they've gone away from most of those insecticide treatments, uh, we're re importing back uh, dung beetles to repopulate our, our prairies, which is kind of interesting. And maggots. Only two more slides, I'll go. Maggots are good, that's how you get rid of weird rock lead. His body's got to be broken down somehow, right? When it's nice and juicy. And then there's ones that take him when he's about uh, consistency. Get rid of lead? Get rid of what, sorry? Weird rock lead. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's breakdown of plant material, but we also do breakdown of animal material. So I know that the, the shiny blue flies, the shiny green flies, we do need them. Um, this is in your turf grasses and in prairie ecosystems too. It's the genus of Photius. It's not a white grub that feeds on the roots, it breaks down the thatch layer. So if you're wondering why you have crows tearing up your lawn, 
is you have a whole bunch of these, you should be doing a little bit of thatch management. You're not having enough nutrient cycling in your lawn. Mm -hmm. You need a healthy lawn. So when you do get your lawn aerated, not solid time punction, but those hollow cores, right? Little goose poops that they lay on top of your lawn. And that brings the microbiological community from the soil zone into the thatch zone to accelerate that biological turnover. So it's just a healthy way to manage those guys. Um, like I say, the longhorn beetles, they do things to trees because the tree's a goner. That's more of a symptom than a cause. It says that tree's time to go. Carpenter ants, they're the stump grinders. Right? Bark beetles kill the tree, longhorn beetles bring it down, carpenter ants grind the stump. It's all part of that cycle of, of nutrients. And then predators and parasitoids. Lots of good things. You know, not all stink bugs bad. Some stink bugs good, because they're, they're feeding. Uh, this is a green lacewing larva feeding on soft bodied insects. There's wasps that provision their nests with prey. There's uh, parasitoids, this is a reconnoid wasp. So wasps lay their egg and they, polyamorine is what it is, and so it divides and divides and divides, and multiple individuals come out of a hornworm. There's a nice little affiliated wasp uh, parasitizing an aphid. Here's trichogramma parasitizing a caterpillar egg. The egg is bigger than the adult wasps. They're phenomenal animals. <laughs> and the vast majority of wasps that we, that we see out there are not yellow jackets. They're parasitoids. Wonderful, wonderful beings. And hopefully I won't traumatize anyone. But um, finally, spiders good. That's all I'm going to say. Spiders good. I mean, jumping spiders cute as a button. I mean, who can fall in love with a Absolutely. Miss Yumina, what a lovely name. Miss Yumina Bathia, the pink flashes. She's a crab spider hiding in a flower. And they're mean, tough, able to take down a wasp. So you can see that spider's good. We have only one spider to, of concern, and that's the black widow spider in southern Alberta. And yes, it does have uh, a neurotoxin in its venom that affects uh, uh, your nervous system. And if uh, left alone long enough, it might paralyze your diaphragm and then uh, prevent you from, from breathing. So uh, be aware that uh, that one's a ground nester. It, it nests in rodent burrows, things like that, um, underneath the seat of outhouses. Okay, oh. just, just saying. Uh, <laughs> <up there. laughs> and, and also irrigation controller boxes if you've got something in the ground. So if you're in the southern part of the province, you need to be aware of that. But otherwise, everything else, it's all good. Um, not that you can't get secondary infections like deep um, tissue bacterial infections from being fangs. So it's not that here or have your have that or but uh, spiders good. I hope that what we've seen here is the cast of characters the functionality of these characters. And that's really what you have to think about in terms of your landscapes, whether, because let's face it, if you're growing something for your purposes, you are manipulating that landscape. Unless you're wild foraging, wild harvesting, you are manipulating that landscape. And in ecological terms, it is defined as disturbed. And there's a whole host of animals, that's their job. It's disturbed, let's go reclaim it and make it healthy again. So that's why a lot of plants are adapted to move in to cultivated systems. So they're not weeds, they're just doing their job. You disturb the land, trying to bring it back to life. So if we can work with them, have really biodiverse systems, and, and that's what Matt Luke's going to talk about, is how to, how, to, how to achieve that, and then a real world example, this will be really cool. So that, if I can leave with you look, thinking about, it, we're talking about food systems, truly think of how systematic, how large and encompassing that system, that functional ecosystem is that you are uh, shepherding and, and looking after. Thanks very much.